Well, welcome everyone to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, I'm interviewing the fabulous author, Adrian Hanks. Now, Adrian Hanks is an inspirational author. He's a coach. He's a psychotherapist and speaker. He's also the director of the Blue Wren Foundation, uh, which is his charity organization, which I'll, I'll ask about in a moment. He shares holistic health and well-being insights, wisdom, and solutions through his writing and with his 20 years of experience working as a counselor and psychotherapist, leading edge master coach and facilitator and trainer. Adrian is married with a blended family of six adult children and has four granddaughters and two goddaughters. He lives on the Gold Coast and loves to body surf in the ocean, write and have lots of fun. Welcome, Adrian. Hey, great to be here with you. Fantastic. Fabulous. Well, that's a little bit of an elevator pitch, but I want to hear your elevator pitch about who you, who you are. Tell the audience about who you are, like a, a short version of that. Well, okay, look, it's always a great question of where to begin in that story. And uh, maybe I'll go way back to the beginning of... Um, um, I was born in the UK, um, so I'm, I'm 58 um, almost. So I was born in, you know, sort of a 60s child and raised through the 70s and uh, early 80s in the UK. And I got really involved with the whole music scene with punk rock. So I was pretty a wild character uh, back okay. in my early days. And I was very fortunate that at the age of uh, 19, I left the UK and moved to Berlin, uh, which was a very political hotspot. Uh, yeah. Back then, that was in 1982, um, um, was my first sort of visit there. And I ended up living there for a, a number of years, about four years in Berlin. Wow. And that was where I really got into my social political understandings. I was reading uh, Orwell and Kafka and all those uh, great sort of more socialist um, writers. And I really got quite involved in the whole idea of um, socialism, not Marxism, uh, in terms of how to be more social, how to get community going, how to be more engaged in that whole social, socio-political space as well. Uh, so I got quite involved in trying to understand world global politics and it set me off on my path. And then um, in 1987, I met my first wife uh, who was a Tasmanian and uh, we got married in, um, in Europe and then we came back to Tassie. Um, so I had this transition from Berlin to Tasmania, which was quite a, a mindset uh, shift for me. And from there, we raised um, our first four children um, in, in Tasmania and lived in Tassie for 10 years. It was quite an experience. And towards the end of that space, I already got quite involved and wanting to be more in that coaching, psychotherapy space of helping people, working with people. Um, so we moved to the mainland in uh, 80, um, Seven uh, was it? No, uh, ninety. The ninety-seven, I think we moved there. So, um, and I started doing a psychotherapy course there um, around the Rudolf Steiner um, school because um, right, we're very yeah. involved. Rudolf Steiner's been my teacher for the last thirty years, um, so I've been very involved with anthroposophy and Steiner. So my my training course on psychotherapy and, and counselling was very much based on the holistic Rudolf Steiner principles. Um, so I started that in um, in Melbourne. We lived in uh, around the Melbourne area, and then about three years into that, and towards the end of completing that, I ended up um, separating, um, and I moved to Africa. And I lived in South Africa for um, nearly two years, and that's where I completed my um, diploma in uh, psychotherapy and counselling. Yeah. And um, so that was in you know twenty years ago now. Um, wow. So I've been yeah around the space for a long time, coaching mentoring, psychotherapy, and I, I tend to blend them. Um, I realize in the coaching space, there's a real need for psychotherapy in that space. So yeah. I bring in a lot of elements of psychotherapy and counseling into my coaching and mentoring as well, because it, it's, it's easier to do all the goal setting and everything and write everything down and do the visioning. But that mindset yeah. <laughs> for me, yeah. it's the key, you know, if, if, and, and understanding that uh, having studied it now for, you know, 20, 30 years of uh, trying to understand uh, human dynamics and the mindset. Um, yeah. Haven't fully grasped it. There's still a lot more of uh, layers. I don't think we'll ever grasp it, Adrian. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I know enough after 20 or 30 years to be able to help people, support people, 
um, from what I've learned from myself and, and from working with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people over the last, uh, you know, 20 plus years. Um, so that's a bit of background. Um, so then well, I had four children with my, my first wife and then met my second wife in, uh, in Cape Town in South Africa, Arleen, and she brought uh, two children to the mix as well. Hence, that's why we have uh, a blended family of, four, <laughs> uh, of six children now, you know, all adults now. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah, fabulous. So there's but, a snippet. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, obviously you love people because you're in the coaching, psychotherapy, yeah. mentoring space. And I can understand how even with politics and the mindset around politics, how you have that interest there, because I've just read 1984 uh, and there was, and particularly in these times, and we'll talk about that this a little bit later, but yeah. particularly the times that we're going through, yeah, 2084, <laughs> love it. <laughs> and thinking about you know, with, with COVID, those that are listening in the future, uh, we're going through COVID at the moment and it's really fascinating how some of, you know, I'm reading 1984 and thinking, well, some of this stuff, <laughs> like I, I'm getting these alarm bells happening of, of mindset and, and all that sort of stuff around what's happening today. So history, I mean, it's not a history, it's, I know it's a fictional book, but and he's, there's so many key learnings that you can have in a, uh, I call them aha moments, yeah. in a fictional book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I was reading 1984 whilst living in Berlin in 1984. Um, oh, wow! Yeah, and uh, and I've 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 read pretty much everything that uh, George Orwell has written. You know, all his essays, his journals, his books, and Animal Farm, and all the other yeah. um, um, books he wrote. He wrote a, a, an amazing array of books. And then uh, and then uh, just to, to jump on that topic, uh, what happened for me was. Um, I read the book again about six years ago and uh, had a, um, a just this idea that um, I'd write like the next version of that book. So, so there it is. I wrote 2084 and uh, published that last year. Yeah. Um, so that's got a lot of story going back into 1984, retelling some of that story and yeah. then having that continuum for a hundred years um, in up until 2084 yeah. where I've gone for the utopian lifestyle, the utopian world, the positive world. So I've taken all that negativity of, you know, what is from 1984 and current time. Yeah. There's a lot of, lot of challenges right now. And I've brought that into a, a hopeful um, novel. So um, yeah. that's where, I, you know, because I'm all about hope and uh, a joy. Yeah. And love uh, that. I want to bring that to the planet. And so for those that haven't, because for us to understand your book. Yeah they need to understand 1984. So how would you describe 1984 for those that haven't read it? Yeah, uh, so just for a bit of background, um, Orwell wrote 1984 in 1948. Um, yeah. He just simply changed the last two uh, numbers around to get the 84. Mm. <laughs> and um, so it's a bit prophetic in terms of what he was writing about, about you know, Big Brother or you know, the, um, the oppressive government controlling yeah. the people. Um, could very much be seen as what's happening today. You know, we're losing a lot of our civil rights, a lot of our voice, a lot of our freedoms. Um, Australia a little bit, but in, in some countries, particularly the, you know, the communist um, countries and China and other countries right yeah. now, there isn't much freedom. Yeah. Um, and this is what Orwell was writing about. And he wrote about um, two main characters in there, Winston and Julia, who went on this journey. And Winston was... The main character in the book where he was a free th a free thinker um it was trying to fight that system and yeah. it's a great story of how an individual will get challenged by that oppressive regime to conform so it's yeah. all about how you know big brother at the time or the government at the time was controlling people um yeah. very you know much as a fascist state and yeah. it, it was a for me it was a warning book of yeah what could happen if we lose those basic freedoms and sadly those basic freedoms are being taken away on so many levels i mean yes. continually and yep. depending how far you want to get down the rabbit hole and yep. i can go down a long way after 30 odd years of studying yep. this um, um the, the politics around this and the oppression around this um so that that's where um orwell wrote about it. he wrote about the um 
dystopian future that he was seeing potentially coming. And of course, for many, it, it's here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I've done, I've, I've taken snippets of Orwell's writings and embedded those in my novel. Um, yeah. So I go backwards and forwards. So um, in the novel, there's um, there's my writing and I've taken some of Orwell's 1984 to embed them. So when people read my novel, they yeah. can also go back and read the contrast or the historical oh, aspect of Steiner. So out yeah. of, um, of Orwell. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I so people who haven't read 1984 can read it, then read mine. But if they don't, this just stands as a, on its own as well because I've embedded some of that story in there so that people do understand uh, what I'm writing about. Um, Beautiful. Uh, yeah. So what impact did 1984 have on you? It must have been a massive one for you to then say, well, I'm going to take this mm -hmm. and I'm going to you know look at you know and I'm going to create 2080 you know 84. Yeah, um, you know, a hundred years forward, like it must have made a huge impact on you. It did. Look, I, I think the fact that I was living in Berlin at the time in 1984, mm -hmm. it's a walled city, uh, you know, so, you know, so, so called a freedom city, it was still a democratic country. And yet it was like an island within, you know, communist Germany. Um, so it was a very interesting place to live at the time. It was, um, you know, to go over the wall into East Germany, into that, um, regime into um was yeah quite a challenge i went across to um east germany a lot i went to uh poland and i went to uh, czechoslovakia went to other um, countries um yeah. in that eastern bloc and i saw that socialist regime some of it i loved you know the the fact that um the state did look supposedly on paper look after everybody and um yeah uh but then I started looking behind the scenes and then I read Animal Farm and a few other um, of Orwell's yeah. very pointed political um, books and realized all that we see is not usually what's actually going on from yeah. the um, political space. So, so the impact it had on me was um, to get more political, to understand the world politically a little yeah. bit more, um, to really understand what was going on around me. I didn't want to be in life with my eyes closed. So I had my eyes wide oh, open. So yeah. I started to question and uh, uh, research. And that research over the last 30 odd years has led me down quite a, um, a deep path of yeah. really getting an understanding of the, I just want to be cautious of my words here, of the, the dark aspect of politics, the dark, dark aspect of oppression. Um, yeah. And the true reasons why people are putting in particular um, um, agreements through parliaments and, and, and through um, the, the governments. And yeah. really, it's about keeping the people oppressed, because if you have a yeah. free voice people, it's hard to run a tight government. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I imagine you really have this interest from, from, from a people point, point of view understanding the social conditioning that happens yeah in regards to and sometimes it's the stuff that this is what what fascinates me is sometimes you think that or, or the community can think that it's a little thing where it's all these little things can be in place for the change to happen yeah. and i remember you know one of the people that have uh i often say this one of my biggest mentors is my son yeah. who uh, has really, you know, he questions everything. As a little kid, he always questioned everything. And, uh, and as an adult, he's always questioning things. He questions me as a coach, you know, what, what do I learn from coaching? Is that true? Is it not true? So he, he really questions beliefs and I love that. Yeah. And I remember once we were in Singapore and my husband's a, a smoker and I can't stand smoke. I just can't stand it. And in Singapore, my husband had to stand in, you know, in the, in, if you're outside, you have to stand in this square in Singapore. I don't know if you've seen that. Okay. They stand in this square. And I said this remark to my son. I thought, oh, I said to him, that would be great in Australia because I can't stand the smoke, you know, people smoking and, and passing me. And he said, mum, be careful what you wish for because it's all part of, it's one thing and then it becomes bigger. You know, so it's firstly it's standing in the square, and if you go outside the square, you get a fine. And there's cameras, that, and and there were cameras. Like people were saying to my husband, "You've got to make sure you're in that square because if you get outside that square, 
you'll get a fine and there's cameras everywhere. And so, yeah. oh. um, and so it's all those, it, it, sometimes it's the little things that people dismiss that, that start, they start there and then it creates the big things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of it um, for me in that, in that coaching mentoring space is getting people to really get an understanding of what their life is for themselves. Uh, what, yeah. what are your what are your beliefs? What are your values? You know, where do you want to go? Um, and there's no judgment around that. Everybody has to make a free choice. You know, I have yeah. mine, you have yours, all clients have their own. But yeah. I, for me, it's all about defining. You know, I say to my clients, as long as you define what it is of why you're living, how you're living and how you want to live, that's the important part for me. So if you can define it for yourself and find your own truth in that, yes. that's the important part. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And whether I agree with that or not, it's not not the case. You know, like everybody has to yeah. make their own free choices around that. And I've got many friends who live a very different lifestyle from me and for their own free choice. And I have my free choice. And this yeah. is the point that I think I got from uh, 1984 and from writing my own novel from 2084 was we have to have freedom. Yeah. We actually have to have, you know, peace, freedom and strength are the three core things for me. And freedom yeah. is the ultimate freedom of the mind. Um, freedom of uh, my civil liberties and my um, and, um, of how I can go about my daily business without yeah. that being restricted um, because I am a free sovereign human being. Um, yeah. So, so I'm a great believer in, I'm not such a great believer in laws, yeah, yeah. but I'm a great believer in community agreements. Yes. So, so if I live in a community and the agreement is I'm gonna, gonna drive 60 kilometers an hour in a certain patch of road, I agree yeah. to that as a good citizen, yeah? yeah, rather than it being made a law to yeah. drive 60. And then if I break that agreement, then there's a community consequence. Yeah. And whatever that might be, you know, but but not necessarily you break that law by law and you get a fine that then goes to police force, but then where does that money go to, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. so I'm not so much into law, particularly yeah. if they're heavy regime laws, but I'm all about community agreement. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, 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 tr I drive um, on the road, not because it's law, but because I'm part of a community that has an agreement to drive at 60 because that's safe. So it's a yeah. very different way we can look at life. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think that that takes a, a bit of a journey for some people. It definitely did take a journey for me, um, particularly because we're programmed from an early age, right? You would know that. So, you know, everything that we've seen on TV or read or, uh, for me, 19, reading 1984 was, you know, part, and I read Animal Farm as well. It was really looking and thinking, you know, so I, I, as a young child, have always thought, for instance, that the government look after you, that they would never do anything to hurt you. I really had this strong belief. Uh, and and for me to shake that belief up a little bit is a really good thing. Yeah. It can be a scary thing, though, because then you're open to what could happen. But again, as you were talking about freedom, uh, us having free will is a really important thing yeah. as well because no one can, can completely control this. So no. whatever you think about, there are circumstances outside of ourselves that we can't control but the great thing is no one can control our free will other yeah, than that, us. That's so true. And some of the great leaders, I mean, a couple of my heroes, um, you know, Nelson Mandela, uh, Madiba, and, and Gandhi, you know, they're two, um, you know, the, I don't know if anybody's ever watched the, the movie. It's a three-hour movie of Gandhi. Um, but if I'd, I'd highly recommend, you know, jump onto uh, the old good of Netflix, uh, watch the three-hour, I think it's three hours and eight minutes of Gandhi. And you can see all the way through, you know, they... People can be beaten and locked up in prison and all those different things. And But what he's really clear on is you're never going to take away my freedom of my mind, the freedom yeah. of my beliefs, the freedom of my inner truth. And that takes a lot of courage. Yeah. You know, same as Nelson Mandela, you know, 28 years in prison. But it takes a lot of courage to keep speaking that. And when I work with my clients as, um, you know, good, good mentors and um, uh, therapists do and coaches do, they allow that unfolding for the clients to really understand and define how their mind works, looking at the yeah. subconscious mind, look, looking at the programming, um, 
all those different things. You just have to pick. <laughs> I'm just going to do a bit of a dance with that background music. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Usually, you're like, oh, I'm sure I turn, sure I turn my phone volume off, and uh, there we go. So uh, I'm sure they come on. It just pops pops up on its own sometimes. Yeah, there you go. It certainly does. So yeah, so it's all about you know um, getting into that space of going. How can I support my clients and uh, to go down whatever rabbit hole they want to do their own research to define where they're at um, yeah. in their lives and then helping to unblock anything that's getting in the way um, to help them in their personal life, their business life, their spiritual life um, to break free and have that clarity. Um, yeah. Even business coaching really is about how can I be free in my business to develop and create and offer what it is I want to offer in my business. So there's a Absolutely. lot of because uh, there's a lot of politics in business as well. Um, you know, yeah. Politics everywhere. Um, yeah. So it, it's it's quite a varied coaching. Is quite varied. It's not about just crossing the T's and dotting the I's for me. It's uh, it actually Absolutely. does go into so many spheres, and I, I feel like um, there's a lot of specialist coaches, which is great. Yeah. But for me, I do the holistic coaching where I try to bring the the physical, the emotional, mental, the spiritual, the political, um, because they're all part of our life. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it takes, you know, talking about the belief systems, I think it takes a lot of courage for an individual to be prepared to challenge their beliefs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and those beliefs that, you know, as I said, between the, I mean, the ages of five to seven are when we form these these strong beliefs often yeah. and to be able to, to challenge them, to be open to challenge them. You know, I often say to my clients, just try it on. Let's just play. You know, let's just play. What if that wasn't true? Um, because they, they, it's like we believe them so strongly that some of those beliefs, those limiting beliefs, can hold us back from the future that we want to create. Yeah. So okay. it does take a lot of courage to be able to challenge those those beliefs. Yeah, yeah. I've got a client at the moment I'm working with who, um, you know, a budding writer. And just even writing the book, you know, the belief systems about um, I'm not good enough and I can't do this and I can't share yeah. this or I can't share this bit of writing. And it's oftentimes it is that limiting belief of um, putting a bit like, you know, me with my novel, the limiting beliefs yeah. of um, and the fear of criticism, the career of, you know, the politics around it. And, you know, what if um, I've said something in the book that's not politically correct? And, well, there's not. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, the fear, yeah, the fear of being judged, right? Yep. And so, yep. you know, and I think, you know, the more, the, the older I'm getting, Adrian, the, and it's, I know that sometimes people will say stuff like, uh, they'll either be, I call it like this pendulum, that they care about everything everyone thinks about them. So that therefore they won't go out there and, and be their you know, authentic self, yeah. or they say, I don't care what anyone says. But for me, I actually believe, my belief is that everyone does care what people think. Yeah. Right? yeah. So they can say it as much as they want, that they care. I know I care, but I think there's this, this medium where you can be in the middle and say, look, I do care what people think. However, I'm going to do it anyway. And yeah. And, you know, have this process of being able to step out there and know that not everyone's going to love what you have to say or, or even love you or like you. And that's okay because they're not your people. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I think particularly with, uh, you know, a type of book that you've, you've written, uh, you know, some people will be attached to it, some people won't, and that's okay. Yeah, uh, it's totally okay, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. particularly when... We're talking about some and politics. When we're talk, you know, talking about politics, they say, I remember my dad said to me when I was as young, he said, don't talk about politics or, or religion or you'll get into arguments. And I get that. Yeah. But now that I'm older, I'm like, I want to discuss, I want to debate stuff like that because right. I think that, that for me to explore those, we should have com open conversations about that. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be an argument. It should be, yeah. what do you think? Let's explore this idea, you know. And the more we can do that as human beings, um, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, and I and I think having that freedom to express is exactly what uh, we need to do. And unfortunately, yeah. and, and sadly, that is being taken away from us in, in many yeah. ways. It's um, 
you know, particularly social media. Um, yes. you know, if you put certain things on there and the fact checker comes up and bang, <laughs> you, know, you get Facebook bans and all that. And yeah. that's not freedom. Yeah. You know, that's an oppressive regime where you don't have the freedom to speak um, an opposing view or a different view or a, a, a different researched view even. Uh, if you don't, yeah. if you don't stick to the vernacular of, you know, the, what the state told you have to say, and yeah. and sadly that's happening around us more and more and more and more, and yeah. it's it's a sad thing because some people aren't seeing it and not being aware of it, and yeah. those that are aware of it suddenly realizing our civil liberties and our freedom of speech they are disappearing. You know, yeah. once you take away freedom of journalism, which is happening, that's yeah. really dangerous. Absolutely. Sadly, even in Australia, you know, there's been yeah. quite a few um, um, laws made to suppress um, certain journalists. Uh, journalists yeah. are being arrested for speaking different um, beliefs. Yeah. Uh, that gets dangerous. And this is really much what Orwell was writing about back in in 1984, um, yeah. was we have to have that freedom. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm a great advocate for freedom. Uh, yeah. I've been fighting for all my life. But, you know, we have to have a voice. We have to have freedom. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I'll, I'll never stop, you know, that's, um, I'll never stop doing that for myself. And, and some people that's, that's fine with, and some people respect that and get on with it. And other people, you know, probably think I'm a uh, crazy left, left wing loony and that's okay. You know, it's a <laughs> the conspiracy theorist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah the, 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 the tin hat, you know, the tin hat. Happy, heard... happy to wear one, really happy yeah, to wear one. I am too, because to me, that's critical thinking. And yeah. I, I heard, well, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard, uh, someone say that uh, that when it was the the word conspiracy conspiracy theorist was yeah. developed after JFK got assassinated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know suddenly it's like oh there's this you know the, these crazy people and yeah. um, and I laugh because I hear the language the programming that happens you know when when someone challenges. Uh, you think something differently than say yeah. what the government say or what the media say, then suddenly it's like this crazy person or this, <laughs> and so all these they describe people in a way when yeah. people are just asking questions. And I think, particularly in the last year and a half of nearly two years now in Australia, for the first time I think it will in my lifetime anyway that it's really come to the forefront yeah. that hold on a minute, now you're not allowed to question yeah uh, and a lot of the population are saying hey no you don't question it as well yeah, <laughs> yeah. Being conditioned yeah and that conditioning is um you know doesn't just come overnight it's years and years and yeah. years and years of conditioning um, absolutely and look and that's not a disrespect to people who are you know in from my view say you know being conditioned it's just yes. that they may not have had the same opportunity as me. They may not have the same um, desire as me. Uh, they just want to go on through life and just, you know, do what they do. And that's actually okay. Uh, but it doesn't mean they can take away my freedom, my civil liberties. That's yeah. Just, you know. And I think the thing is that most people don't know that they're conditioned. And we're, we are all conditioned. Like there's still boundaries of, of beliefs that I have that I, I still say to myself, oh, I didn't realize I had that boundary no. you know but I, I know I had um for years I had this thing about working really really hard when I was sick yeah and so and I would wear it as a badge of honor Adrian like it would be like I can still this is you know I don't know if you remember that ad you know soldier on with codrill soldier right. on with codrill, <laughs> soldier on. that was me I thought like, I can still do this yeah and it wasn't until probably 10 years ago that I realised that it wasn't serving me. No. Uh, and so we all have these these conditions, these beliefs that don't serve us. And this social conditioning, once you're aware of it, you can't not see it. Like I look, at, we don't watch the news here yeah. uh, in in our household, but you know sometimes it will pop up, uh, and you know it'll and you'll hear the music. Right, ah, no. Alert! <laughs> it's like oh. Okay, better listen now because yeah, there's yeah. the music, boom, boom, and then it says alert, and then it says things like, uh, you know, there's and with COVID at the moment, and I said there's like a spread of two thousand people, and it's and it's like, is that really true? You know, so I'll listen to everything. I'll listen to the the 
the voice, uh, the describing words of uh, if there was a protest, those crazy people that were violent and, you know, and I see all of that and I think, wow, I, once you see it, you can't unsee it. You, yeah, see, so you, true. you see that conditioning happening. Um, so I'm really thrilled that you've, that you've got a, that you've created this book because I loved 1984, absolutely yeah. loved it. I loved Animal Farm as well. And your book, 2084, again, it can get people thinking. It can yeah. open your mind. A fictional book can completely open your mind. If, In fact, I think that sometimes fiction is easier to open your mind because it's like you're not attached to saying is this true or not because you can go it's just it's a fictional story it's a fictional book yeah absolutely. So let's, and you go with it and so i think fictional stories can be fantastic at opening people's minds yeah yeah so, so tell us a little bit about 2084 yeah um so in essence what happens is um it starts in 2084 and uh the main characters in that book go on a historical adventure to uncover their historical family past. And, and through that hundred years, they go back to that time in 1984 um, with Winston and Julia, the two main characters in yeah. Orwell's book. And, um, and, and what happened was um, just to, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just read um, off yeah. the back cover of where I got the inspiration from. Um, and on the back of the book, it says, it was from reading just a few words in part three, chapter six of Orwell's 1984, that Adrian felt the first inspirational spark for the plot of 2084. And the words he read were, it was at her waist had grown thicker and in a surprising way, it stiffened. So what happens is um, the main character, Winston, you remember, remember um, yeah. the last time he sees Julie is outside the, uh, the Chestnut Cafe and he sees her and he says those words, you know, um, it's that are, um, she'd grown thicker and he noticed that she'd actually got bigger. That's the last time he sees her. So I've yeah. taken a poetic license in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. To introduce my book. I'm not going to share what that is because I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I've taken one little snippet and it, it's like it just dropped on me at that moment that there, there's my in moment of where yeah. to start my new novel. I'd always wanted to write like, the next version um yeah. and it was just reading those that little one-liner i went there's my in and yeah. i had this inspiration of what that moment yeah. was for julia and winston in that moment and then you can probably guess it because of the, the description um yeah. but it's um and i went from there and then i just sat and i wrote 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 and four years later um produced a book um well, and interestingly enough um, it was May last year, so just over uh, 12 months ago, where I'd nearly finished and I was talking to a friend. I said, it doesn't feel quite complete. There's something not quite full. And he said, Adrian, what's happening in the world right now? He said, you've got, you know, COVID-19 happening. It's yeah. the biggest sort of global event ever in, the, you know, in history, really. And uh, he said, it's not in your book. So when people read your book in, you know, 10 years time, 20 years time, 30 years times, because you've got historical moments in there. Yeah. That has to be in there. So my last chapter I wrote was actually called uh, COVID-19 2020. Oh, brilliant. And um, and that as soon as that was done, it was like I knew the book was complete. Yeah. Love yeah. it. What it I love tied in tied yeah. into the whole theme. What I love about what you've said about your book is because when I read 1984, I felt it was really deep and really quite heavy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, even just the thought of, you know, you, they've got these televisions that they watch you every single time you're sleeping, they're watching you sleep, the big brother's watching you sleep. Uh, but it was quite heavy and, and dark. Yeah. And I love how you're saying that you've, you've spun it a little bit, you know, yeah. to, to make it lighter. Uh, so how have you done that? Uh, by having hope in the future. Yeah. Uh, because as humanity, we have a choice. We're on a pendulum right now, and we can, you know, drop into that um, regimes around the world, and, and they, yeah. there are lots of them, you know, and um, potentially we can all go down that road if we're not careful and cautious, and if we don't stand up and speak, or yeah. we can speak, 
as a collective, we can speak as a community, we can speak as a global nation and say we're not willing to be controlled and we're not willing to go down that road of um, fascism. Um, yeah. Some people, you know, communism, fascism quite closely linked for some people. Uh, yeah. I just like to call it what it is, fascism, um, yeah. where the, you know, it's mind controlled and it's taking away civil liberties. Um, so yeah. I've taken the opposite where people did stand up, people did speak, people did revolt, people did go out and, you know, peaceful revolutions. And yeah. um, and finally, the hope in the book is that everybody lives in a utopian society um, with the government that they've put in place that they trust and um, and accept. Um, they have their own um, global currency that's all been put into um, a sharing perspective. Everybody puts in some time and energy into creating a better world. There is a peacekeeping force to keep the peace, uh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah. what I've done, I've taken snippets of things I've learned through my life and different organizations or religions or people who have solutions. Yeah. And I've brought some of those solutions and beliefs into the book. So from a historical perspective, uh, for instance, yeah. I've got um, Greg Braden's in the book, Bruce Lipton's in the book uh, with their permission. You know, I've got their permission yeah. to have them in the book. Um, yeah. So some great thought leaders are in there. Um, I've written about uh, a cryptocurrency that um, I believe, you know, can be, um, a global currency for people to work in. Um, yeah. I've got some things from the Baha'i faith. I've got things from um, uh, something in Africa called, called Ubuntu. Um, you know, so I've, I've brought in lots of different ideas and thoughts and politics and, and ways of being and living. And I've yeah. enmeshed them all into this new hopeful future. Um, and that's from you know, years of research and interviewing people and speaking to people and reading people's books and watching videos and, uh, and just brought it all into a novel so uh, pretty exciting um yeah. so then people can go and you know google those people or follow those people down the rabbit hole to see what what else they have to say um, yeah you know, and that's them Haramain and people of like that are in the book you know for instance yeah. and uh, yeah um so so quite interesting in terms of having real life people in the book i love that and i love i love how you talk about hope because one of the things in 1984 because it was so for me and i can only talk about my perspective it was quite yeah. deep and dark and there was so there was so many learnings in that book for me but there but there was always that you know I was like I wanted more hope in that book and I won't say what the for the those that haven't read it yet but the ending was didn't I was a little bit deflated yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so to know that there's another book that yeah. gives that hope that you know, and, and throughout and to be able to see it in a different light I think that's a, a beautiful way to continue on yeah um the story is to then flip it and give that hope and that light and uh and to see things differently and say that because particularly in these times you know yeah. as I said I think that you know we can always control what's in here uh but to be able to have that hope and you know I I'm always a believer that you know, even one person can make a massive change. Yeah, um, and I think what can happen in in when when governments suppress people or suppress voices, people think, well, what can one person do? You know, what can I do? No one yeah. else is standing up. But if you can do it in your way to be able to say, hold on, if, if there's anything in life that you don't believe in and that you want to stand for, then stand for it. You know, yeah. it's really put yourself. And I know that uh, particularly these times that, you know, I've had a lot of private messages uh, from clients and from friends to say, I really want to step up. I really want to say something, yeah. but I'm scared to say something. You know, I've had people say, particularly now with the vaccines and things like that, there's, there's people that have said, I've tried to, that don't agree with the vaccines yeah. and then are saying, you know, my family have turned on me. Yeah. You know, or I don't want to say things about what's happening because my business might suffer and I might lose clients. Um, so there's big decisions around speaking up, isn't it? You oh, know, absolutely, there are, yeah. yeah. And, and fear is a huge one, you know, and yeah. I, I write about that a lot in my book and, you know, because I've quoted um, George Orwell in there, of course, fear is one of the massive things that um, you know, Big Brother used um, in 1984. Yeah was the fear of the masses and putting the fear of, you know, particularly with the uh, oppressive, you know, um, armed forces, the police force in there. And a lot of people, you know, in Australia and other countries are quite terrified of the armed forces, uh, you know, and the police 
uh, the police states. Yeah. And you see that in Australia now with what's happened with um, you know some of the big rallies and things across the world in yeah. Australia. Uh, the police have gone in and there's a lot of fear in the police. Um, yeah. Um, because the police aren't what they used to be 10 years ago, 20 or 30 years ago. They're a very different uh, beast than they were um, um, 20, 30 years ago. The, yeah. the local Bobby on the street is not there anymore, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's not there, you know? So, you know, I was brought up with a local Bobby, you tap you on the shoulder and, you know, tell you off and take you around the corner and have a bit of a word. You know, yeah. maybe you don't sit sit at the kitchen table with mum and have a coffee and, you know, <laughs> and, and give you the warning if you're a bad boy, that's, you know, but that's yeah. not like that anymore. It's like totally changed, totally changed. Yeah. You know, it's uh, so much. And I, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of no disrespect um, yeah. because of that, because of what people are seeing, you know, yeah. through the media and um, through television of, you know, the way they're being treated by these armed, you know, police yeah. and um and it, it's it's not okay. Um, and if yeah. we don't stand up for those rights, um, and even having the the courage to speak our rights, yeah, um, that that's a challenge for a lot of people. So fear is huge. You know, the fear of yeah. being beaten, the fear of being locked up, the fear of being put in a prison cell for thirty days without representation of a lawyer. All those things that have been brought in, yeah, that simply weren't there. The terrorist act now is all there. You know, all that stuff yeah. wasn't there previously. Um, yeah. So it's indicative of what's happening in the world, of course, and they have to keep up with, you know, protecting the community. But yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's a big story. <laughs> it is. It's massive. And once, as you said, you go down that rabbit hole, and I think it, it's interesting even the communities that, because you and I are, are coaches, right? So, yeah. so I, I don't know about you, but being surrounded by coaches who have been trained in social conditioning and NLP and all those types of things are very awake to all of this. It's yeah. very, so, you know, they, my community are like, wow, they're frustrated. They see what's happening. Uh, and then there's other people that cannot see it at all. It's like, mm -hmm. it goes crazy. Nothing's happening. You know, I watch the news. Yeah. Um, I, even, I, I even had a bit of a giggle the other day because there were two ads on. One was the, uh, I think it was Channel 9 or whatever, and it said the trusted source, the trusted, right. and it kept saying trusted, trusted. And then I think there's 9.com.au that said something else similar to that. Yeah. Uh, and, and and I get why, why people think, are you guys the crazy ones? Like, yeah. <laughs> you're seeing all the stuff that's not true, but uh, it, I suppose you believe what you see. You yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah, like... Yeah. You know, you see, if, and if this is all you see and you don't and you're not prepared to see anything else, then yeah. that's that's your form of the truth. Yeah, totally. And there's many, 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 many truths, you know, and that's the yeah. reality of a, yeah, there's a truth and there's a whole truth and there's nothing but the truth. And it depends which truth you want to live in. Um, Absolutely. They've all, got, they've all got their challenges. And, um, yeah. and really, at the end of the day, none of us really, truly know what the truth is anyway. We can only find our own inner truth. Um, yeah. And we have to trust that inner truth. And that's, you know, getting back to that intuition and um, inner knowing, uh, which is yeah. a lot of what I teach in my in my programs in my, um, yeah. with my clients is you've got to find that def definition for yourself. You've got to find that intuition for yourself. You've got to find the inner truth. And nobody yeah. can take that away. Yeah. Nobody can take that away. And one, one thing I really love about you, Adrian, and this is, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted you on my podcast is that you're educating people in a way yeah. that people can be open to that you know I, and that's what i i strive to do yeah. with my posts or my podcast or my writing I, I want to educate people to be able to just open their mind to the possibility of their beliefs maybe not being true the yeah. possibilities out there to, just to be more aware uh and i think you know and i love that about what you've done and and what you've written in your new book is to to open their mind to say well but I'll leave, maybe there's something out there here that i'm missing yeah maybe i can and being a fictional book can help them do that yeah absolutely yeah just yeah. you know there's, there's just a little gateway for people to uh, have a look at if they choose to and then if they want yeah. to close the gate and not go there that's actually okay as well yeah absolutely so have you got any new books on the horizon so this yeah. this one did so 2084 did that take you Four years, did you say? Yeah, that was four years in the making. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of editing and a lot of work with my editor, um, you know, did an amazing job. 
and then uh, you know getting um, getting the publishers. So I'm self-published, but I've got a uh, published author down in Melbourne, and uh, so the book's available uh, through um, Intertype. Um, so there's a platform there; people can you know get the book from there, or they can get it me if they want the limited edition um, uh, copy. They get yeah. it direct from me, and I can actually sign them and send them out as well. Oh. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah. so Adrian, can you give me, I think you've already sent me, have you sent me that link with the limited edition? I'll send that through to you. Yeah. yeah. So those of you that uh, want that link, I'll be putting that on the um, the Zoom link. So yeah. with, under under this recording on yeah. Spotify and wherever you're going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's pretty easy. That's just, uh, that's my website, adrianhanks.com, um, straight into the bookstore. Uh, there's actually a whole page and a video. Uh, that I've got on there about um, my, my whole process about writing it. So it's quite interactive. I want to build a bit of a community around this as well. And my big yeah. dream, uh, Janelle, is to, is to make a movie from it. I'd like to get a, a um, movie or a, or a Netflix series. Uh, that's my my bigger vision, my next vision. Um, that would be fabulous. Yeah. Oh, uh, and how many books have you written, Adrian? Uh, so I, my first book, um, I'll just show you briefly. Um, got them here. So my first book was my Wendy and the Fairy Ring Secret book. That's my yeah. little children's book. I wrote that about uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, I've got my personal development book, which is Where Am I Right Now? Um, so this is a story about my coaching, counseling, and some anecdotes and stories in there. So I'm re-editing that at the moment. So there's going to be a new version of this coming out, new cover, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Probably beginning of uh, 2022. I'm also co-author of a book called Psychophonetics. This is my, this is the, um, what I do in my, my, uh, coaching and my counseling and psychotherapy yeah. it's called psychophonetics yeah. and uh and there's i've got a chapter in the book with other therapists in there um brilliant as well and then um i'm currently working on several other um books as well another novel i've written uh and writing and editing called amanda and um and i've I've got about nine other books on the go as well that i want to nine other books my yeah. goodness so, um, so over the next you know three, four, five years, I hope to get them all published and um, out there. I want to spend more time in my writing career and make a yeah. living more from writing. Um, so, you know, um, you know, my, my vision is to sell a million copies of this book. That's my, uh, my vision. Love and, it. and I'm just holding vision for that. Oh, you know? Wonderful. Love that. So, yeah. So, yeah, quite a, I, I just love writing. It's just um, when I'm in that zone of writing, I'm absolutely love being in that space. It's, uh, so yeah. for, for the, the, and you talked about one of your clients before in regards to writing their book and the challenges that they've had. What would be the tips for people? I'm writing my own book as well, Adrian. Yep. Uh, what would be the tips, the top tips in writing a book? Yeah, so set your writing times. Yeah. Yeah, set, you know, commit to writing one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20 hours a week, whatever that is, and block it out in the diary and just write and write and write and write. And stay yeah. away from the index. Yeah. Not stay away from the um, back cover. Stay away from trying to create the title. Just write the content. Yeah. Because continually, you know, I, I do um, book writing programs. People, I help people. I mentor people in writing. And yeah. the key thing I says is write the bulk, write the content, and then you can worry about the cover and the back cover and the index and the um, testimonials and all the dedications. That's like the coating. Yeah. Like, you know, write, get clear about what it is you're writing, you know, define what you're writing about, you know, and just write it. And then afterwards, you can sort out what chapter goes where and which bit goes where and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And yeah. one of the biggest tips ever I got from one of my coaches many years ago was he said to me, Adrian, are you a writer or an editor? And I said, I'm a writer. He said, right, you write, leave the editing to the editor. Ah, good. Well, that's great advice. Because I was spending hours, weeks, months on editing, and then still having to send it to an editor anyway. Yeah. Um, so just you know, put your time, energy, and money budget into what it is, and then find a really good editor, because it'll yeah. make it'll save you hours of stress, tension, uh, mistakes. Because uh, one good editor is you know I read so many books that are poorly edited, or yeah. unedited, or self-edited. And it just ruins the book. Yeah. You no, know, so I highly recommend get an editor. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like at least a good editor. Not not your cousin who was, you know, yeah. um, edited a magazine, you know, like but a real professional editor. Yeah. 
Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So it, do you think writer's block is a, is a real thing? No. No, no. Writer, writer's block's an excuse. Yeah. And when, sometimes yeah. when you're wanting, because it, it's interesting for me because, and I know everyone's different, but for me, when I write, whether it be my uh, blog or whatever I'm writing, I get so much, every time I move, like I get up and walk. And so I often write and I <laughs> put, I, I have something down, I'll just write and then I'll go for a walk around the house and then I'll come up with this inspiration yeah. is there anything like that that happens for you that you do one thing that you how oh, that helps me with my ideas uh no look as, as soon as i've got a uh, my fingers on the on the keyboard and my pen in my hand yeah um um i can just start writing on anything any idea any thought and what i do and what i've come to realize what i do i play the movie in front of me and then I have to use my two finger typing skills yeah. <laughs> the that's unfolding in front of me. So I feel like it's a download. Um, yeah. it's, uh, like the, the inspiration, the vision, the images are there. And I, particularly my new, you know, my novel writing is like the story is unfolding in front of me and I'm creating it, you know, from downloading it, if you like, from, from the muse. And yeah. I've just got to simply keep up with it. So I, yeah. I keep notes. I've got like little inspiration books. Sometimes I record ideas if I'm, you know, particularly if I'm driving. Um, yeah. But mostly I just, you know, make it up as I'm writing, because yeah. I'm in the because I'm in the zone. It, it's just it. All the information is there. Like it's in, it's in, it's in space. It's in the, um, in the cosmos. It's in the universe. Yeah. And yeah. all I have to do is tap into it. Um, yeah. And then what I do, I create my characters. I create the scenes, uh, and then I just start writing and. It just just arrives to me, you know, whether that's a gift or whether it's just yeah. I'm tuned in. Probably a bit of both. And um, allowing yourself to to express that, yeah. I think often people will stop stop themselves from from being creative. And and I've had clients in the past that have said, "I'm not creative." I'm like, Everyone's creative. Like, <laughs> if you have a belief you're not creative, you know, every I believe everyone is creative. Everybody's creative. Just allow yeah. your you know your imagination to to flow and to trust that and i think when you've got that trust and you allow that to flow that's where your ideas can and i often say this with my team when we're when we're coming up with ideas for my business i'll say no idea is a is a bad idea because no. even if it's a crazy idea that you'd never use that one idea could be a seed for the next idea just like what you said about reading 1984 and that one little paragraph that you read that triggered something. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe other people may not even understand, well, that why did that trigger, you know, this book? But for you, it did. It, it triggered did, yeah. something yeah. to inspire you to create something else. Yeah. And I'd read that sentence, you know, because I've read um, 1984 probably you know, six, seven, seven times in my lifetime. Yeah. So I've read it, that sentence over and over, but this one time, I think I was looking for the pathway into writing the novel. So I was open to looking for whatever that spark of inspiration was. Yeah. Um, so part of me was partly searching for that as well. Um, yeah. And as soon as I read it, I just knew that was my inroad. And it was like, from there, everything took off. It was quite amazing. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adrian. We're going to finish off with some rapid fire questions. Are right. you ready? And you've got some ready. Things, so I'm a bit scared. Yeah, All, me right. Too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, other than 1984 or any of your own books, what's what's been your favourite book to read? Uh, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds by Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. It's my go-to spiritual directory. Brilliant. Uh, beach or countryside? Oh, um, both. I, I try and swim. I was in the ocean this morning at uh, Adam M. So I try to swim body surf every morning. But I love going bush with, with my ditch. And I, I love rocks, you know, because I'm, I'm an earth scientist. So I love being in the country. So, so a blend of both for balance. What's been your most embarrassing moment? Oh, dear. Um, that's an interesting one. Uh, oh. <laughs> Oh, okay, really, really, really quick one. I've, I've had lots of them. Uh, as a teenager on the ferry, sitting with all these big trucky guys, and uh, everybody was using a little plastic cup as an ashtray. 
Yeah. And uh, and I was really tired, like I've been traveling all night and to go across to France. And I leant across to flick my ash in the cup. And it was one of these big burly blokes. And it was this cup of tea. It wasn't an oh. ash. <laughs> So yeah, that's a yeah. good one. <laughs> I mean, who, would, good. who would play you in a movie? Who would play me in a movie? Ooh. Um, oh, I'm not really good at actors. Uh, I'd have to say Tom Hanks because I'm <laughs> Adrian Hanks. <laughs> I love it. Um, if you were asked to cook a dish, what would you cook and why? Oh. Um, I would cook an Adrian pizza. I'm really famous for my Adrian pizzas. Oh, yum. I love pizza. Uh, your mentor, a mentor that you've had. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So I've had quite a few mentors in my time. Um, and one that comes to mind, I've actually got a mastermind partner, Barry. Um, I've been with him for 12 years now. We mastermind every week and talk. Um, so he's my mastermind. But my mentor, there's a guy in South Africa called, called Bruce Copley. He's in his 70s and he's given me some amazing, amazing um, mentoring in the last couple of years, yeah. particularly personal. So. Beautiful. <laughs> What's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Ooh. Um, strangest thing I've ever eaten. I've actually eaten horse. Ooh. when I was a teenager in Belgium um I was over there and uh and on the menu was and I ate and afterwards I saw cheval and it was like horse meat so that was a bit Did weird it tastes like chicken <laughs> they usually say everything tastes like chicken it was sort of like sort of like beef uh, what's the favorite place to travel oh um I've got a lot but Botswana is one of my absolute favorite places in the world I just Beautiful. love being in Botswana Craziest thing you've ever done? <laughs> Today, yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> done some really crazy things. Um, probably one of them was, yeah, moving to Berlin when I was 19 years old. Yeah, beautiful. As a 19 year old moving to this crazy German city. And what legacy do you want to leave? Uh, one is my book. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, oh, that's, that's a big really, one. That's a big, big one. Yeah, it is. Brilliant. All right, my time. All righty. I, yeah, I, I went through this and I thought, right, let's have a uh, <laughs> ten questions for uh, for Janelle. So, what's the scariest thing you've ever experienced? Uh, one of the scariest was walking on fire at a Tony Robbins event. Okay. Well. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you have a favorite color? Red. And why? Oh, because it's fiery and it's got yeah. energy. Yeah. Do you have a lucky number? Seven. That's the okay. month I was born. Fantastic. Are you superstitious? And if so, what is one superstition that stands out for you? No, I'm not superstitious. So no black cats, no... No, no, nothing. no. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> what is something funny you love to do to other people? Uh, I love to scare my sons. <laughs> So I'll call him and then he'll he'll be looking, he'll go, what mum? And then I'll be behind something and then I'll pop out and scare him. That's hilarious. Uh, are you ticklish? Very. And if so, what's your most ticklish spot? On the sides, on the sides here. All right. So I'll remember that next time. Yeah. Uh, what's your favourite motivational person? Oh, I've got many. I love Tony Robbins. Um, that's one. Uh, gee, I love Brene Brown. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got lots. Lisa yeah. Nichols, I love Lisa Nichols as well. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's your go to naughty snack? Uh, chocolate, yeah, yeah. So, anything <laughs> <laughs> I love Ferrero Rocher. There you go. Christmas there's, time. Your, there's your naughty. Um, <laughs> a person who you'd love to spend the day with, uh. I would say my dad, he, my dad, he's not here anymore, but right. yeah, okay. bring him yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, okay. beautiful. And if you had one wish for today for yourself, what would it be? Uh, my one wish is to make a massive positive difference in the world. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. You've been such a pleasure. And uh, as I said, I will put your link 
on uh, and I'll post this on Facebook. So please, guys, you're, are you on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn yeah. and um, yeah, uh, Twitter and all those different things. Yeah, beautiful. So make sure you go and follow Adrian. Make sure you buy his book. So I'll get your post uh, that link on there for you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, well, yeah, you have an amazing, beautiful day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See ya. Bye.